Hello, everyone. Welcome to the virtual panel. We're so excited to join us online. So we have very, you know, very good four panelists joining here today. And we're going to start off by introducing our name, our hometown, our academic focus, and why Oberlin for every each one of us. And I'll stay by myself. Um, so my name is Luke. I'm from Nanjing, China. And I'm doing politics and economics double major at Oberlin. I'm a fourth year, so I'm about to you know, leave Oberlin next year, which is the sad thing. And maybe I guess the happy thing for me at the same time. And I guess why Oberlin for me is, you know, Oberlin is a very good liberal arts college that you know allows you to explore your different interests across different subjects. You know, I was interested in physics and politics at the same time. Why you know before going to college, so Oberlin become a natural choice. It's a liberal arts college. You don't have to decide your major for the first two years. You got I got plenty of you know opportunities to explore. And you know, Oberlin has a very strong connection to you know East Asia and politics in general. So that's you know like what I. Like want to have in my college, so that's exactly you know why I chose Oberlin. Great. Okay. Hi, my name is Rio. I'm a second year. I'm an econ and math double major with an education studies concentration and East Asian studies minor. Um, I'm from. Or I'm originally from Japan. I grew up in Japan, Vietnam, and Tunisia. And why Oberlin? Um, one is because of the conservatory. I played a flute and piccolo, and I wanted to be in the Arts and Sciences Orchestra. Um, and also like the academic that um, we talked about as well, because I wanted to do like economics and also education, and I wanted to see like the mixture of that. Hello, everyone. My name is Kayla. Um, I have lived a lot of places, but I'll claim Pittsburgh as my own. I'm double majoring in gender, sexuality, feminist studies, which is our women's studies program kind of expanded to be more inclusive, and also law and society. So I'm on a pre-law track with a politics minor. Um, I am here at Oberlin um, for a kind of a weird reason, but my American studies teacher in high school, or American history teacher in high school went to Oberlin. And every time that Oberlin would come up in our history class, he would joke and be like, that's where you all should go to college. <laughs> and I would laugh in his face and be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then I was looking to be able to play basketball at the time where I was going to school. And so I got um, recruited to come to the school that was called Oberlin and I knew what it was. <laughs> and so I visited, fell in love with the campus, fell in love with the people and ended up here. By the way, I'm kind of sick, so if I'm drinking water blowing my <laughs> nose that's why um if i sound a little bit under the weather yeah that's me hi guys i'm adrian uh i'm originally from san diego california i'm a senior here at oberlin and i study in the creative writing department i applied to oberlin specifically because of the creative writing program but to be honest, I didn't know much else about the college at that time. And then it wasn't until I got in that I actually like went and did my research and really fell in love with the school. Um, and the reason I ended up choosing Oberlin was because when I came to visit campus, I felt this sense of just excitement in general, excitement about education, excitement about your peers and talking to them, telling them what you're doing, hearing about what they're interested in. Um, and it just made me feel like this would be a place where I could continue to learn and grow in a really supportive environment. And that has absolutely proven to be true over my four years here so far. Great. So we have our next question is, where do you find the community at Oberlin? And where, what basically, you know, what are you involved in? Um, so for me, you know, I would talk so I'm thinking of two communities right now. One is, you know, international student organizations. That's, you know, because I'm, you know, come from China, you know, there's also lots of international students on campus that are opening from lots of different countries. And, you know, because of the specific international student organizations, we got to know each other. We got to talk about different you know, cultures, you know, because, and we are kind of like our common struggle of adjusting to the new life, at, you know, in a small town in Ohio. Um, but, you know, it's very exciting to, you know, see lots of people are going through the same saying, while, you know, also, you know, you can kind of like know different cultures at the same time. Um, and I think the second community I have right now is the politics department, because, you know, I'm a senior, I got involved in, you know, that makes up a little bit more when, you know, I go a little bit, you know, higher in your class level. So um, the reason I love, you know, just love about politics department is, you know, politics department have lots of, you know, good professors that really care about their, what they are teaching and also the students. So you can just maybe drop in, you know, for their office hour and you will chat not only about, you know, what you're not reading or, you know, what the politics you're thinking of, but also, you know, your personal stories or, your, you know, what you're thinking right now for your, you know, I don't know, families or your struggles right now. That's like another emotional support for me throughout the four years I've been here. Um, you know, we have a very good East Asian 
uh, such Chinese politics professor at Obeling, and he has been constantly you know, supporting me, you know, both academically and also like personally. He knows you know why sometimes you know I cared too much about some politics in China, and he kind of like are able to, to kind of ease me out and tell me you know, why this is important, but also on the other hand, I shouldn't be taking it too personal sometimes. Um, and I'm pretty sure Rayo can also share something about international students here. Yeah, well. so I am involved with a couple of cultural groups, including the International Student Organization that I'm chair currently, and then the Japanese Student Association and Foundation Committee. Um, I think all these orgs kind of like bring together people who are have like the same like, or similar backgrounds or interests, identities, and it's really nice to be together with people to kind of like share struggles or as um, we talked about, but also like um, share our own culture and talk about it. Um, yeah, for like international student organization, we often hold events on weekends, like a movie night where we watch American movies and kind of like um, that's, look at that's American very culture. Good. <laughs> that's, that's very, very good. Yeah, um, we also had like a trivia night where um, we had a bunch of questions about different countries around the world to see how much you know about the world. It was really fun. I actually um, won the first place. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were here. Yeah, yeah thanks, like the first place. Um, and then another community I think I can think of is the Arts and Sciences Orchestra because um, it's like a group for college students who are interested in music. And it's nice to get um, to know other students in the college who maybe I'm like taking a math class with who actually plays an instrument as well. And it feels very different to be with people playing an instrument versus being in a class or some other org. Um, and also fun fact, the conductor is a conservatory professor, but um, she started the orchestra as a student at Oberlin. And I think it's really cool that she also like shares this passion of like having an orchestra for college students. For sure. So I have to second the politics department. Luke and I were actually in a class yes, together, a seminar class, a couple of semesters ago, two semesters right. ago. Yeah, maybe. Um, but uh, places that I found community on Oberlin's campus have been, obviously the women's basketball team when I used to play was kind of my first initial home when I got here. Um, it was a really cool opportunity for me to get to know people, including the athletic community, um, the women's sports teams community specifically, um, and I made some of my best friends that way. I want to encourage though people to understand that classes are a really great way for other people to find communities. I made some of my best friends through the classes I took very simply going up and like introducing myself on the first day and being like hi I'm Kayla I'm interested in these things and then we started talking we'd go see movies at our local movie theater the Apollo and like became fast friends um, but a place I unlikely thought I'd find a place for community, but that has been probably one of my biggest places of community has been the admissions office. Um, I started working here my second semester freshman year, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be a tour guide. It's going to be like really low key. You know, it's going to be just a job for me. And it's turned out that I've made some of my best friends through the admissions office. Um, I get to hang out with really cool people who are really passionate about what they love to do, including Oberlin, which sharing that passion is really exciting. And that's just been like my through my jobs has been probably the biggest forms of community possible. Yeah, I, I definitely second that. I think admissions is just a really, really nice community. Um, but outside of that, I think I found community in the classroom, like you mentioned, but specifically in my first year seminar. So first year seminars aren't something you're required to take at Oberlin, but they're recommended and I would highly recommend it. Basically what happens is that you are placed in a class with 15 other first years and then it caps at that small number. Your professor has had to design this class, which is like a passion project for them. And they also had to show interest in working with first year specifically. So they're really there for you and then you get to know your peers really well through the same process. Um, I loved my first year seminar so much. Weirdly, a few of the people who were in that seminar now also work with me in admission. So that's like Aww. two communities merging. Um, but we still get together. My professor takes us out to brunch. He took us apple picking, things like that. Um, and it's not like, it wasn't as if they were my best friends on campus day one, but they were always a really safe place to land. And I think that's still true even as a senior. Um, and also I lived in a themed hall my first couple years on campus. So as an option, you can do like there's programs houses, there's language houses, heritage houses, and then there are themed halls that you can apply to live in. I lived in Classics Hall, um, and I made two of my very best friends in the world, like day one of orientation, we lived in that hall, and now we live together in a house with seniors. So that was one of my major communities. I definitely agree on the first year seminar thing, because I actually made my uh, China politics professor at a seminar, so like the day one, I already know who I'll be working with for yeah. the rest of my college life, so that's a really good way. Yeah. I encourage everyone to basically sign up for the first year seminar. Whatever you are interested in, that's a good way to start college. So now we have next question. Um, so 
Uh, we have Sam ask us, uh, could you describe your typical weekdays and typical weekends? Yes. Um, yes that's yeah. not so <laughs> and we don't necessarily need to do this in order. So whoever wants to jump in, just. Oh my start. God. Yes. I'll describe my typical weekday because it's madness, but like the <laughs> best kind of madness. Uh, I love being busy and my G calendar, my Google calendar, people look at it and are like, Kayla, how do you survive? But my typical weekday, um, I'm going to describe when I have a morning class. So on Tuesday, Thursdays, I have a morning class that meets at 9.30. So normally I wake up at 8.30. I go get my coffee and like a scone at Slow Train, which is our local uh, coffee shop. We have two Slow Train in the local. Um, and I love going to Slow Train. The vibe is just amazing. And so I go and get something to drink there, like a hot chocolate and a scone. Then I go to my class. Um, that's from 9.30 until 10.50. Then at 10.50, I, um, you know, sprint my little butt back to Con, which is where I live, um, where I have a meeting with my area coordinator because I'm an RA, and we'll meet and talk about my residence, talk about all the new things happening in residential um, assisted life, um, residential education life, sorry, as an RA, kind of my role. Then after that, um, I will normally do work from, um, what time does that normally end? Like 11.30 until 12. I'll have appointments from 12 until 1. Then I'll have a class from 1.30. <laughs> well, I eat in between there. Then I'll have a class from 1.30 until 2.45. And then I have another class from 3 until 4.20. And then I have a meeting for PAL training, and we'll talk about the PAL group soon. Um, at 5 until 5 to 6. Then I'll eat dinner. Then I'll have my PAL sessions from 8 to 9. And then I'll go home, and I'll do LSAT prep. And then I'll go to bed and I'll start all over again. Wow. <laughs> okay. It I'm, makes so, so much harder for that. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to describe a slightly more chill day. Because <laughs> maybe you don't, maybe you thrive on the busyness, but maybe you're like me and you're a little bit more of a slow, just want to go with the flow throughout your day. I do find <laughs> yeah, San Diego coming out. <laughs> I do find that like getting myself up and out of bed in the morning is key because if I don't have something I need to do in the morning, I just won't get up and I won't do anything. Um, so generally what I do is I work in the mornings. I often come in here to admissions and um, do some work or if I'm not scheduled that day, then I'll like get up and go do some homework at a coffee shop or something. Um, for me personally, I prefer to have afternoon classes rather than morning classes. And so I, per I scheduled myself on purpose to have all afternoon classes this year. So I'll have like a work shift or just do homework in the morning. Then I go and I have a leisurely lunch for an hour to an hour and a half and just talk to people because that's like my main social time <laughs> is my lunch. <laughs> and then I go to class for the afternoon. Um, and then usually I'll go home and like make some tea and eat a snack and maybe do some work, maybe just hang out with my housemates. Um, and then generally in the evening, I either go to dinner or cook dinner for myself and then I have some sort of org. So I have like dance team or I'll run a pal session. Mm -hmm. um, I have meetings maybe in the evening. So evening does also tend to be like a, like a work time, but fun work, like clubs, yeah. things like that. Yeah. And then I just start all over again. The next yeah. Day. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's I totally agree. You know, I think also because you know, if you become older, you got more choice to yeah. like make, and you have like less classes, more kind of like individual studies. You know, because I'm doing honor right now, and honor is definitely more like you know your personal study, what you know you actually care about, and it's more sp spending more time in like actual like libraries or you know mod than in you know classrooms yeah. or talking to professors. So you know, we definitely have more time with ourselves than being a classroom. And my typical day, you know, if I go on a busy day, is, you know, I got class, you know, at like 9.30. So I, you know, I woke up at, you know, a little bit late, 9. I'm not <laughs> going to say, but, you know, it's, I woke up at 9 and I grab something to eat and then just go to classes. And, uh, you know, after class, I go to lunch with my friends. You know, that's also a social time for me as well. But, you know, I'm, I have, like, more limited time than you because I also have, like, classes in the afternoon. And so my class in the afternoon usually start at, you know, 1.30. Like, and sometimes I need to like stay in the classroom till like five, which is not very good, but you know, you, you kind of like, you know, classroom are also the place to show social, you know, yeah. by the way. So, um, you know, I stay till five, you know, and you know, I go talk to other people and you know, just chat after class and go on dinner, like, you know, go to dinners and still with friends and, you know, talk about each other. And I think evenings are the most time I do my series, like homework and, you know, other readings. I'm kind of like more an evening person than a morning person. So I really enjoy, you know, spending evenings myself. 
uh, doing readings and other things, but uh, you know, usually I do I also got, you know, some club sports or, you know, some organization things coming up in the evening. So I need to like attend to it, but also, you know, it's a good mixture of, you know, you know, social organizations and also like individual reading times for me. Uh, and, you know, that's the day and, you know, you start over. So. <laughs> what is your weekend like? Weekend, wait. Yeah, that's something we haven't talked about. Yeah. <laughs> wait, I really don't know. That's okay. Yeah, everyone right. has very different weekends. So. Yeah, everyone's weekends look really different depending on what mm. you, what like you're looking for in the weekend. I know because I have like a lot of schoolwork um, and then clubs and orgs, I do a lot of my work work and admissions um, and then homework during the weekends. So normally I'll wake up early have an admissions work shift um, and then I'll go eat some lunch hang out with some friends maybe grab brunch um, and then do homework for a little while and then there's tons of stuff that goes on in the evenings I know there's constantly like concerts and lectures that happen in the evenings so you'll probably find me going to one of those um, and then last night I went to bed super early um, and then woke up and did the same thing again for a Sunday but now I get to be on a virtual panel with all the beautiful people yeah that doesn't happen every week <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I definitely think that weekends like they vary by person's interest but also by like um just what's going on for you that week so even just for me my weekends look very different depending on how much work I have that week or like if I know something exciting is coming up maybe I'll work ahead so I can make sure I have more time to go out and then rest and do whatever I need yeah. to do if I want to participate in a certain event so I think like there's always something going on but it's really what you make of it if you want to be out on the town if you want to like go out, see your friends, go to a concert, absolutely available to you. But if you prefer to stay in, read oh, yeah. a book, be cozy, yeah. do your homework, no one's going to judge you for that. People exactly. are super into that. So exactly. it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I have weekends where I just like stay in the library the whole day, it's, like the term coming up and <laughs> yeah. studying. Yeah. But then some weekends, like, you know, I go to events. But um, yesterday there was like a multicultural sports event on campus. Um, oh, cool. It was hosted by the Chinese oh. Student Association. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I got a BT there yesterday, so I didn't go. But yes, I agree. Yeah, so I went to that. <laughs> Great, yes. Well, also, you know, weekend for me is you know, actually some time for me to actually do some like exercise. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, during the work days, you know, I got like, sometimes so busy, you know, I got, you know, go to classes from 9 to 7, as I said. So, you know, I have you know, I, I love swimming, I love, you know, just going in the pool and dying for like one hour or two. But, you know, that doesn't usually happen, you know, uh, you know during the weekdays, you actually have to uh, find a good time on weekends and to just, you know, spend time in a swimming pool. Either by myself, but sometimes I got friends and they are, you know, they go with, along with me. But, you know, that's a good time to do all other things you don't have time for your weekdays and weekends definitely, you know, and you have lots of options at Obli. We have, you know, really good gym. I've just recently renovated the pool. You know, available to us, you know, there's lots of you know, opportunities to explore you know, weekend plans. Yeah. Okay, so we have next question is uh, we have another people uh, ask, you know, what we want to know about uh, study away opportunities at Obling and what this Obling London program looks like. Awesome. Yes. Um, okay, I'll jump on this one because I actually just got back from studying away. Right. <laughs> um, so I studied in Rome this past semester in the spring and it was super cool, first of all. But if you want to know just like what the process of study away at Oberlin is like, so we have a really great office dedicated to study away. Um, the reason we call it away versus abroad is because some people do programs in the States. Like maybe you want to go to New York and do an acting program, or we have a border studies program in Arizona. Um, but most people do go internationally. About 75% of students here have some sort of international experience by the time they graduate. So that's a really great number. Um, and there's a lot of different opportunities. We have more than 90 affiliated programs that the college has vetted, sent people to, and you can apply. And once you're in, guaranteed credits and um, financial aid will transfer. But then if you're like me and there's like more than 90 amazing programs, but you find something really weird and specific you want to do that is not listed, yeah. <laughs> you can still petition to have that become affiliated. So that's what I did. And the office was super, super helpful in that process for me. Um, they worked with me. They helped me write that whole application for the committee. Yeah. And I was able to like know really early whether or not I could go on the program or if I had to find something else. And then once you get that um, approved, everything will transfer in the exact same way as if it were an affiliated program. So 
super cool office. I worked with this guy named Mike Rinaldi. He's a hero. Shout out, Mike. <laughs> um, but also, because we have winter term, you don't necessarily need to go for a whole semester. Yeah. You could get international for just a month. You could do it in the summer. summer. They're very, very flexible. Um, so that was my per personal experience. Yeah, I um, uh, went through a process of studying away in the summertime, uh, which I think is really cool because the program I applied to actually was an educational college-based program um, in Copenhagen, Denmark, mm -hmm. and it was um, to study criminal law in Copenhagen, Denmark, and actually get credits to transfer over from the classes that I took in the summertime to count for classes um, in my major, which was actually kind of cool. Uh, and so the program uh, was looking at criminal justice. We actually um, had the ability to go to uh, jails and prisons Whoa. in Copenhagen, which are completely different than in the United States, mm -hmm. um, and have uh, people who are incarcerated come talk to us about like their experience and the rehabilitation process of everything. So that process was actually really user-friendly. I also have um, accommodations because I have food allergies and so studying abroad can be kind of difficult and the study away office and the program that I applied to were really flexible with meeting those accommodations so making sure that the living accommodations that I had the health accommodations that I had eating accommodations that I had would make everything as accessible as possible and as safe as possible for me to be able to go and study abroad so I just want to say that if anyone's like worried about um, of whatever outside reason that they couldn't study abroad we want to make it as easy as possible for you to do that whether that be financial means or some health issues or something along those lines um, so I highly recommend summertime especially if you have a lot going on and just can't manage it for a semester long mm -hmm. summertime can be a really great like introduction portion of that I totally I totally agree you know what you just you two just said about studying away because I went to uh, affiliate program in uh, Oxford England and you know you know besides you know the program being very accessible and they actually have you know, but part of the reason that they have those affiliate programs is they have lots of like institutional arrangement. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, partner with, you know, some other agencies in England. Yeah. And besides, you know, Oxford actual university that help you kind of like adjust to a new life. And because, you know, you become a first year, like a new first year again, you know, <laughs> abroad. Uh, so, you know, you, you actually have like partners uh, both at Obling and also like abroad to help you kind of adjust to a new life. And also, you know, just tell you about, you know, safety laws, and all other things because you can, could be very different from the United States. Yeah. And you know, and also I think the credit transfer is very, very, very quick for affiliate programs. I got my down in three weeks like uh, after I got back because you know I'm a senior and you know, all the graduates graduate. Mm -hmm. So three weeks very, you know, very good for me to kind of like see what I need for graduation. Yeah. So that's uh, actual plus for my program. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Does anyone have insights to Oberlin in London? Yeah, so <laughs> actually um, Two of my best friends are doing Oberlin, are leaving me next semester to do Oberlin in London, which as excited as I am, I'm also really sad that they're going to be gone for the whole semester, but I'm actually going to London to visit them. Um, so Oberlin in London is a pretty unique program because instead of being affiliated with Oberlin, you're actually still in at Oberlin College, you just happen to be studying in London, <laughs> um, which is pretty cool. So if you actually go onto the course catalog, the Oberlin in London classes will be available on the course catalog. Every, um, it happens in spring every semester, spring, so every spring semester every year, there we go. <laughs> and um, different Oberlin and London programs are affiliated with different departments. So this year it's English and politics, that are the two affiliate departments. Um, and a sp specific professor will go from each department and teach all of the classes in that kind of cluster. And you're going to be taking um, a bunch of different types of classes, most often having to do um, with like politics in London or in, uh, English opportunities in London um, with a cohort of the same people who are going to London with you. You also live in a flat, you live in an apartment in London um, with other Oberlin students uh, and it's actually, I've heard, as financially accessible, possibly a little less um, expensive to study in London for Oberlin in London than a full semester at Oberlin, <laughs> meaning if you're, um, if you're financial aid, trans if you have financial aid here at Oberlin, all of that is going to transfer over to London because you're actually enrolled in the college and not in, um, not in a separate study abroad program, which is what a lot of the affiliate programs look like. Yeah. 
And if the things fit your major, it's really easy to like get those courses to go towards your requirements. Exactly. So like my two, one of my friends is an English major and one of my friends is a politics major. And they're literally like right on track with finishing their majors and not having to worry about transferring any of the credits over because they're already within the institution of Oberlin. So that's a really, really awesome program to apply for if you're interested in studying abroad um, and want to make sure that you're just going to have like the smoothest, best experience. And London is such a cool city um but people speak english so you don't have to worry <laughs> about the language barrier um right. that other places might present itself yeah. also they have a really good accent you know to <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was sitting there so i can tell you that um and also you know if you are more curious about the financial aid part of something abroad like either you know you opening london program or other uh, any other abroad or away programs you can always talk to financial aid office. They are, you know, super successful. They're always available to talk to, talk to you through this, yeah. you know, once you decide to do one of those programs. So now we have next question. Uh, Theo ask, uh, in what ways do students interact with the town at opening and what is town like? Mm -hmm. Theo, do you want to talk about that a little sure. bit? Um, so one interaction I've had is that there's a small origami shop in downtown yeah. Overland. Wait, where? Um, <laughs> it's, Okay. Yeah, it's like above him. Oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so I've been like collaborating with this person and trying to teach an extra at Oberlin um, about origami. So like there's, I think, a lot of ways to like go into town and like interact with people in the town. Um, another another thing, especially for international students, there's this old couple in town that um, oh, yeah. gives, um, serves dinner for international students every yeah. Sunday. It's like open to all Oberlin students, oh, actually. Right. And they're like super nice. It's just like a house, but it's open to all students. Sunday dinners, and I think it's like a nice way for me to get out of the college campus yeah. and interact with people. In the I went once and the both of the people friended me on Facebook, and they just like post pictures of their cats. It's real cute. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, I love food, um, and so one of the coolest, I think, one of the coolest things about Oberlin's town is that although it's a small town, we have tons of different types of food available. Um, we have three um, Mexican-inspired food restaurants. Um, for such a small town, it's so random. We have a Thai place that's opening up. Um, we wow. have like a classic um, <laughs> American-style food place called The Fev. Um, we have a diner-style place called Oberlin Kitchen. That's brunch, guys. Um, that's, that's the best place for brunch. Their French toast is <laughs> top <laughs> Um But I'm a big fan of food um and so there's a mandarin place kim's um we have lots of options yeah there's just so you know we're not sponsored by any of them <laughs> <laughs> we're just doing great after them yeah uh -huh. so i really like um you know speaking of food there's actually a new chinese uh, restaurant opening up just now and so now we actually have two chinese restaurants in just a small town at Oakley. So, you know, in Central Student, I know are really like, excited for this because, you know, the authenticity of their food is really good. And, you know, people are just, you know, enjoying going there because, you know, lots of festivals you know, from different cultures are coming up. So people are actually enjoying the real, like, authentic food. Um, and besides that, I think, you know, be besides the family host uh, dinners for Central Student, I think there's also a program called the Host Family. Oh, yeah. Is that still? Okay. Yeah. I, see, yeah, I have a friend, like, in the Host Family program, it's, you know, basically like all college actually stepping and partner you with a family that willing to adopt a host Aww. child, I guess, oh. in a sense. Yeah, 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 and they, you got a chance to interact and basically go to their home, talk to them, have dinner with them, or they take you out, I think it's a few times a month. That's and that's a really good way of, you know, for international students and also for, you know, students from you know, other states um, to basically adjust and to get to know local people and to see, you know, what it's actually like at opening. Yeah. And, you know, it's a good way to, to kind of, you know, the both kind of like the cultural exposure to local and also have, you know, someone you can talk to that is, you know, older than you, have more experience at the local, you know, at Oberlin. So. And sometimes it's nice to talk to people who aren't your exact age. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I forgot agree. about it. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now I have another question. So Autumn asks, do you uh, participate in co-ops? And if so, could you tell me what's your co-op experience? <laughs> and you know, what are the co-ops exactly? Um, does anyone here actually eat in a co-op? I can talk about co-ops from a perspective of not eating in co-ops. Um, I'm not I'm not a co-op. Okay, I, I, I eat in the winter term. That's uh, not okay. like semi. Yeah. Well, so 
Um, okay, so none of us officially eat in co-ops. Quick disclaimer, we don't want to pretend to be co-opers. We're like, not. <laughs> um, but to talk about what co-ops are is it's basically students taking complete initiative of the food that they're eating. So at Overland, you have two options when it comes to dining. You can either eat in campus dining services, which is traditional meal swipes. So you go into a main dining hall, you have your card that has meal swipes on it, you swipe in and have a variety of food. Or you have co-ops, which is a group of people who are actually voting and then preparing the food that they're eating on a daily basis. Um, so what that looks like is you're preparing the food, you're serving the food, you're consuming the food, and you're cleaning the food. Um, so you have to put in about four to five hours of work per week to get three meals a day, seven days a week. Um, and it's a pretty cool gig just because um, you get really great aspects of community since you're eating with the same people every day. Um, and then a lot of co-ops are themed in some ways, meaning that, like, for example, we have... Um, a kosher and halal following co-op. Um, so if you have food um, restrictions, if you have dietary values that you're trying to uphold, co-ops are a really great option because they're so like individualized and personalized. Yeah. So that's kind of what a co-op is. From a non-co-op perspective, you can actually get invited to co-op meals pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. um, so I have tons of friends who do eat in co-ops and who cook in co-ops and will tell me, oh my gosh, I have a cook shift today. Do you want to come by for lunch? Um, and then I get to hang out, have a really great, delicious meal um, that are made, maybe rice and beans. That's a pretty popular co-op co-op staple um, <laughs> with like some salad and um eat with people, with friends, um, enjoy the community, talk about events and things that are happening on campus, um, and then maybe help out with cleaning up since I was so um, kindly invited to the co-op. So that's kind of an uh, overview of what co-ops are, and as a non-co-oper, you can still have an experience when you're eating yeah. in co-ops. As a, I guess as a sort of uh, actual cooper, <laughs> <laughs> just sort of. Um, I so I basically participated in a co-op. I think it's Pile. Yeah. Uh, Pile co-op in base, uh, located in a, the basement of Asia House. Um, uh, doing a winter term and maybe winter term the wrong things a little bit different from the usual semester. But uh, what I know from the experience is you know as a cooper you sign up for shifts, either as cooks or as, you know, clean up, you know, after everyone's done with their meals. So, you know, for shifts, you actually can, you know, basically cook for everyone else. And, you know, um, so if you want to be a hand chef, so that's the people who make up the recipe and give others to other chefs, you have to go through the trainings and all you know, different regulations about food security. So basically that guarantees what you know, the student cooked, what student cooked, I actually say for everyone to eat. Yeah. And also, but that's also a good process for you to actually learn about local safety laws and also to learn actually how to cook and make recipes. You know, yeah. they have a partnership with Bon Appetit. Sometimes ago, I think they have the chef from Bon Appetit teach, oh, yeah. like I think there's some time, some semester ago, possible. teach, yeah, teach, possible, yes, <laughs> teach cooks, um, you know, how to make recipes. So that's actually a good, very good way to learn how to cook, yeah. you know, from co-ops. And, you know, by cooking and with other people at the same time, it's also a good way of, you know, socialize with other people, actually yeah. know what everybody's doing. And, you know, it's, it's also a good way to of learning, you know, what other people's life. Yeah. All right. We got next question is what things residential halls exist at Oberlin? And mm. I think you'll talk a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are several different themed halls at Oberlin. I used to live on Classics Hall, which was like, people who liked Greek and ancient Rome and stuff like that, which is not actually my major. I was just like, ah, oh, Percy Jackson kid. Like, I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great, it was a great time. So I'm not actually sure if Classics Hall is running this year, but that was like a major one and one of the longest running ones. The mm. most popular themed hall, I would say, is Sci-Fi Fantasy Hall by far. But now Sci-Fi Hall is a house. Yeah, now it's a house because it got so popular. It's yeah. out of control, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I'm not sure what other theme halls are running this year. That's not yeah. do Disability Solidarity Hall, um, Latinx Hall. Um, so uh, that's actually working too to become possibly eventually a um, identity-based housing space. But that's something that's running this year. Um, a pretty popular hall for a long time, but I don't think is running this year is Harry Potter Hall. Um, <laughs> sure. uh, I basically made my hall Harry Potter Hall, <laughs> not, not officially, but like kind of. Um, there's World Culture Wing in a first year mm, dorm, yeah. and a lot of like international students and students with different like experiences um, live there. Yeah. yeah. And also for you know people have 
some sort, of, sort of like religious beliefs or other kind of like different kind of experience from their high school. We, we have this hall called Substance Free Hall. Yeah. And that's a so, uh, very, that, that's a house now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That was making that uh, very bigger. Okay. I think, um, you know, for people who kind of like a little bit afraid of, you know, coming to Oberlin, you know, that's a very kind of like a very liberal place. You know, yeah, you know, people need the time of the, you know, adjustment to kind of like what actually happening on the ground at Oberlin. So, and that, I think that hall is a very good place to start is if you have any concerns with substance, that hall basically don't allow anyone yeah. to bring substance in or under influence of substance kind of like stepping that hall. Yeah. So that's a good way of, you know, making, you know, you, the place you live comfortable because you want to make your room comfortable while also kind of exploring yourself where your boundaries are and different you know, aspects of your beliefs. And, you know, so we definitely accommodate people with different preferences. You know, we have, you know, not only just, you know, personal interests, but also kind of like personal habits or yeah. life. Yeah, know. there's also like yeah. a quiet house. Exactly. So if you're someone who really needs a quiet space to exist, study in. Mm -hmm. um, and then like we mentioned briefly earlier, there's like um, language houses and heritage houses too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are just, they're, they're called program houses on campus, um, but basically they're exactly what they sound like. They're based off of the name, um, spaces that exist in some kind of particular way to accommodate particular types of students. So if you need like that quiet experience, right. quiet hall is great. If you want a substance-free experience, um, one guaranteed in that capacity, substance-free house is great. Um, if you want to live with other people who have similar identity factors as you, uh, Asia House, um, Jewish Heritage House, Africana Heritage House are all kind of heritage-based houses that are options. Exactly. Um, exactly. And those you apply for. Exactly. All right. Now we have another question. So what kind of music communities are there for college students? Are there performance options? Yeah, so there's the orchestra um, specifically. Wait. Specifically for college students, although you could also audition into conservatory op orchestras. And then there's also like chamber, ensemble chamber music opportunities for um, college students, as well as the musical union, which is like a big choir um, that's open for, to all students as well as community members. Um, and yeah, <laughs> basically, um, all of these are designed for college students and they all have um, performance opportunities as well. So the college orchestra performs four times per year in Penny Chapel. It's like the big chapel we have. It's like the same um, concert location as like the conservatory orchestras. We do have an audition, but a lot of students get in. And I think it's a great way for um, college students to get involved with music. Um, otherwise, we also have secondary lessons. Um, it's open to all college students you can audition in. If you audition in, you can take lessons for two credits. Um, and then if you don't audition, you can also pay to take lessons. At a by, super discounted yeah, rate. Yeah, at a very discounted rate by conservatory students and faculty. There are actually also like normal music classes, like, you know, saying, introduction to saying, that are available for college students, two of my friends are doing that class. And they are basically asking all the friends about, you know, the songs options they can do for the finals and midterms. And I, you know, I'm super fan of, you know, all the musicals there. So I like recommend tons of songs for them. But, you know, they just don't pick my, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, that's a sense. Anyway, but that's, you know, definitely a good, you know, way of, you know, if you're interested in anything besides instruments, you know, you have singing, performing, and other things that are available to um, college students as well. And that's part of your normal curriculum. So you don't need to actually pay you know, actual fees, fees or anything. So, and you know, like me, if you are big musical fans, you know, I'm signing up for it next semester. So, yeah. Yeah, there is also the musical studies major within the College of Arts right. and Sciences. Um, so like, if you are not someone who wants to be on a pretty professional music track, but you do want to work in music in the future, you can further your studies at, in a, like, in a bachelor program in the college. Yeah. 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 And all the orchestra and musical unions are actually classes, so you can get credits from it. It's yeah. not just an extracurricular. I think it's really nice too. Yeah. That's also true for um, singing classes. Cool. Yeah. Concerts. Okay. Ooh. So um, okay. I, we have. To, I'm just gonna say it because you know it's the elephant in the room. Lizzo came to Oberlin last yes. year. Yeah, I was. Yes. Yeah. I was um, so. It was completely free and. Um, no, life changing. So I just want to throw that. So just in case anyone didn't hear the question, so we're now talking about the concerts we haven't been to. Yeah. And we talk about Lisa. Oh, <laughs> I also just saw her over fall break and it was saw her again. life changing for a second time. Really? <laughs> but also like 
Punch Brothers come every year. One of them's actually an Oberlin grad, and they both perform and then also run workshops. So a lot of the artists who are brought to campus will give workshops when they're here, which is really, really cool. Um, but some of my favorite concerts I've gone to have actually just been, like, cover band showcase, which yeah. is students getting up, like, picking a band and performing songs, and they just – they embody these musicians, it's yeah. awesome. And there's always a professor band at the end of Cover Band Showcase, oh, yeah. which is my absolute favorite thing. <laughs> I actually think I like going to recitals. Um, a lot of like third years and fourth years in the conservatory have like personal recitals, mm -hmm. and it's really nice to see my friends do their own recitals and play a bunch of music on stage. Another one I went recently was the organ poem. Oh yeah. Um, it's yeah, like a it monthly event where um, it's like an organ concert, but at the end they invite the whole audience to lie on stage and feel the vibration of the organ. Mm -hmm. It was kind of scared that everyone was like rushing to the stage <laughs> yes. to like, get the good spot, yeah. but still it was like a nice and precious experience to like lie on stage. It's also at midnight, yeah. so it's yeah. spooky. It's totally <laughs> and it's it was like the it. Halloween one. So it was, it was yeah. really spooky. Yeah. There's also, I, I totally agree with the junior and senior recitals. Mm -hmm. uh, but one funny kind of anecdote that happened to me is, so there are, at this time, there are only six harp majors on campus, and two of them happened to be in my same class with me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like, every day we would talk about the harp, and then finally they were like, you should come to my junior and senior recitals. And I was like, all right. So I went to the harp performance. I've never seen a harp perform ever, or a harp perform by itself. I'm like, oh, <laughs> enchanted. Uh, I've never seen someone perform on the harp before. It was unbelievable. So junior and senior recitals were pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And also on top of that, you know, we have a whole orchestra called Obling Orchestra yeah. of all good musicians from conservatory performing, you know, as orchestra together for, you know, whoever, you know, wants to jump in to the Finnish Chapel. And, you know, I think the level of, you know, the, the level of their play are just, you know, beyond anything. Because I've been studying abroad, I know what other <laughs> big universities, what their orchestra are like, and I would say opening orchestra is like the best one I've seen so far. And it's all definitely beyond the college, you know, those are definitely not undergrads, no more undergrads will play. It's definitely, you know, more, definitely more than exceptional, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Okay, so next question is, what are some of uh, the challenges you face as an opening student? You know, so far? That's a good one. Yes. I, I always talk about, um, we here at Overlin are very high achieving. <laughs> 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 we really like to be good at what we do and do a lot of it. Um, and sometimes that can be a lot. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges for me personally has just been realizing, as you can probably tell by my schedule I talked about <laughs> earlier, I like to do things and I like to be really busy. Um, but figuring out how to balance my life with like being academically really busy and being really excited to like excel in that capacity, but then also taking time for myself to be a person um, and to have a social life um, and to care about other things outside of just um, academics and like work and all of the things that keep me really busy. And so just making sure that like as busy as my Google calendar is that I do keep moments for myself um, to sit down and relax and take a breath and drink tea um, and recover if I'm feeling sick like I am today um, and spend time with other people. That's been a constant learning experience for me and a right. constant balance. So I would say that's probably the biggest challenge that personally I face while I've been here. I agree. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, yeah, I think also, um, and I think this maybe applies to any, any liberal arts school, but you're asked to explore across disciplines. So like there's no specific GEs, like no like math 101 that you must take to graduate, but you do have distribution requirements. So you have to take certain classes that are outside your major area. Um, and I think that it was a bit of a learning curve for me to be okay with going into a space where I wasn't necessarily good at what was being mm, taught. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, it can be scary to be put into a classroom and be like, oh, I don't know this subject and I've gotten used to being really good at this one particular thing. Yeah. Um, so that actually has been super, super beneficial to me. Yeah. And now I'm like, not afraid to try something completely new and I'm not afraid to be bad at it at first, but it's all okay. Yeah. But that took me a second to adjust to for sure. <laughs> Yeah, adding on to that, when I came, I was, like, scared of the size of Oberlin. I know it's not big, but then, you know, when you first come, it's kind of weird to, like, be taking classes and all these classes, they're, like, totally different people, yeah. totally new people, 
And then once I adjusted and after like a semester, I was like, oh wait, I know all these people. Mm -hmm. Oberlin is actually small, but it came from a super small high school. So it wasn't an adjustment to come to like a big context and like more classes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think also in general, you know, as in general students, the biggest challenge I face, especially in my first year, is, you know, getting to know different people from different backgrounds than you. And, you know, I actually talk to them about, you know, how they feel about things and in a very genuine way. It's, it's somehow very challenging because you've never learned that from, you know, like me, you know, from high school that, you know, it's very kind of like homogeneous and, you know, very kind of like have our own mainstream culture and, you know, adjusting to the different culture, especially Oberlin, is exceptionally diverse campus. You kind of like learn it through, you know, every day, basically talking to people and interacting with people. And that's, you know, could be rewarding and challenging at the same time. But, you know, I think, you know, from hindsight, I would say just keep trying and you are going to get a lot of things out of it. So, yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question, um, does Oberlin have mandatory general education choices? And what, what uh, classes, sorry. What type of uh, classes do first year students typically take? That's yeah, something so, Adrian. Like I was saying, there's no GEs, but I can kind of explain better what distribution requirements are. So all the majors and then the classes within those majors at Oberlin are divided up into three categories. Those are the arts and humanities, then the natural sciences slash math, and then social sciences. And as a student here, you have to take at least two classes in each of those areas plus two classes outside your major division. So for me, I'm creative writing, I'm in the arts and humanities. So I need two natural science credits, two social science credits, plus one more of each of those, or I can mix and match however I want to do it, as long as it's two outside arts and humanities. Um, so that's really your only GE. Um, but for as for like what a typical first year schedule looks like, I think it's really up to you. Generally, I would say it's a great time to explore and kind of take more um, intro level things and do it across disciplines. So you can start knocking those requirements out early. But I mean, I was given that advice as a first year and to be honest, I didn't do it. <laughs> so, and I, I'm okay, like I turned out fine. I'm gonna graduate, but <laughs> it, it really depends on what you're interested in exploring, I think. Yes. Someone I know told me that their first, their freshman year, they took for the first, so the whole freshman year, the first two semesters, intro classes in eight different fields. <laughs> they chose not to major in any of them. Um, and they're going to graduate and are really <laughs> excited about what they're studying and what they're right. doing. So it really can be as specialized or as generalized as you want. Mm -hmm. um, but because you don't have to declare until the end of your sophomore year, your first um, two semesters, your freshman year, are really meant to be experimental times where you're trying out a bunch of different things that you potentially could be interested in mm -hmm. or like never knew that you were interested in to get a sense of like what you want to do. I came in pre-med, I am not leaving pre-med, um, and I tried some pre-med classes, I tried some pre-law classes, I tried some um, hard sciences, social sciences, arts and humanities, dabbled in a bunch of things, and then ended up with my majors. So it really depends on the person. So Sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I think besides the division requirements, we also have a cultural diversity writing requirement yeah. and also and quality, quality yeah. reasoning. So one of the things it works, I think, is you, you take different classes and some classes have both social science division and also cultural diversity yeah. um, like tag on it. So, you know, once you take those classes, you're both fulfilling the division requirement and also the cultural diversity requirement. And I think every student needs to fulfill three cultural diversity classes. Three cultural diversity three classes. classes. Two, two writing, writing two writing classes. And two, yes. two, yes. And two cultural things. reasoning. And it's pretty it's super easy to you know finish. As I said, you can do a class that you know fulfill basically two requirements at the same time. And you know, everyone I know don't you know necessarily worry about those at all once you go into the third year and uh, fourth year. So it's very super easy and it's kind of like a requirement, you know, required to you explore different things. And for me, you know, because I come in as, you know, people interested in interdisciplinary studies, it's, it's a very good thing for me, actually, so. Yeah. I was just going to add on for first year's first year seminar is definitely a big thing. We talked about it briefly um, before, yeah. but um, what was nice for me was that there's a resource librarian assigned to each first year yeah. seminar, and they, like, help you use the library resources, and that was really nice to get to know how to use the library and everything. Um, and you could use, actually take more than one first year seminar. It's offered both in the fall and the spring. So I had a friend who took a first year seminar in the fall and then one in the spring oh, as well. Cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's actually possible too. 
Yeah. And now we have next question. So Shannon from Argentina. Oh, we have international audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's good, you know. Um, so the question is, what's the serious thing like at Oberlin? Are any of us like particularly involved in theater? Um, I watch a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I was involved with one when we had this um, Japanese traditional performer come this past mm, fall, right. and um, I was like backstage helping out with it. But um, we have like a big size hall and then a middle size um, theater and then a small black box theater as well. Mm -hmm. And I was in the middle size theater, and it was nice that they were able to transform the theater into like a Japanese traditional stage and then make the thing happen. So I think it's really nice that they're adaptable. And they also have like a nice costume workshop and like the backstage things that um, they also try to emphasize in backstage. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as far as I know, to be a theater major at Oberlin, you can kind of, there's a few different tracks you can take. You can be very performance-based or you can be more behind the scenes, like technical, you're making costumes, you're doing lighting, sound, things like that. Um, but no matter which area you're focused in, you are asked to take courses in like performance as well as the more technical side of things because they want you to get a sense of the whole theater experience. Um, but outside of like being an actual major in the department, which is a really great department, you also can be participating through ASA, which is the Oberlin Student Theater Association. They put on plays every semester, often student run plays. Um, then there will be a department run play in the fall and I believe a department run is our department run musicals in the spring? Is that how I think goes? so. Yes. Yeah. And then, so there's lots of different opportunities to be involved. And you don't necessarily have to be, like, heavily involved in theater to pick it up at some time. So, For sure. Yeah. Like, I have a friend who wrote a play over the summer. It's actually a musical part of <laughs> how dare you how dare I and now she's putting it on in the theater here at Oberlin and I had no idea that she had any interest in the theater whatsoever until mm -hmm. she was like I'm doing a play do you want to audition for it and I didn't because oh I had never is performed is the same way like, <laughs> putting on a play here and was yeah. like on audition and I was like what <laughs> so it's really it's one of those things where you can take as much advantage of it as you want, be involved to whatever degree you want. Yeah. And sometimes like with me, I just go I just go see the shows, yeah. but it's a really vibrant yeah. community to be involved in yeah. in any way. And theater is through the College of Arts and Sciences. Yeah. Um, we actually don't have musical theater in the conservatory, which is a um, misconception often. So if you're interested in musical theater and theater, that's gonna be through the College of Arts and Sciences rather than the conservatory. Right. So definitely, you know, the theater scene at Oberlin is definitely very rich. You know, again, I'm comparing my studying away uh, experience. So I, you know, about doing my studying away experience, I missed a lot about music, Oberlin's music and theater and you play, all the plays are going on. And, you know, we are having a bunch of them during the parents' weekend, I think. So, and there are definitely two or three more. I think there's at least two musical playing at the end of the six month year. So that's a lot of, you know, things you can just, you know, go and see if you're not, you know, interested in performing for it. But if you are interested in, you know, actually being one um, being on one of the shows, you can actually audition, do the audition for any of them, even yeah. you, even though you are not a theater major. So that's you know a big plus for anyone just you know try want to try their hands. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is, what's your favorite class you've taken, and what why did you like it? Fascinating. <laughs> I, I know the answer to this question so easily. Okay, get started, get started. I'm so sorry. Sure, sure. I feel like I'm hijacking the conversation, but <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I took a class called Gender, Sexuality, and the Law. Um, little Kayla, she was undecided, um, <laughs> like floating in the wind, really didn't know what she wanted to do with her life, um, trying to get it together, having existential crises really often. And then she walks into this class and she actually sat it. Why am I talking about myself in the third person? <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually sat it on when I was a prospective student here. And I took the class, it's with my current advisor now. Uh, and I was like, this is the class um, that is going to decide and let, like, this is the class that I needed to take because this is what I want to do with my life. Um, I want to go to law school. I want to do advocacy work. I want to work in social justice and legal studies. Like it just mind blown. Um, so gender sexuality in the law with Harry Hirsch, best class, but he's retired. <laughs> Oh no, that's sad. That's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. 
Yeah, my absolute favorite is my current class, Language Pedagogy by Kim Hover. It's a class that's been running for over 20 years now, actually. Um, and so the students in the class are required to teach a language while they're taking it. Um, so a lot of people are involved in the SICE program, the Spanish and elementary schools, where um, college students go into the local elementary schools and teach Spanish in the classes. And then some students, um, me included, are doing a TA um, for the ESOL, English for Speakers of Other Languages program. And what is nice about the class is that um, for me, it's super small, so I got to be close with all of the people in the class. And also, because it's like a pedagogy class, the professor often also tweaks her own pedagogy and how she teaches and makes us learn from what she does in the class. So she would like maybe turn the lights off and lights on and everything, or make a, makes us move around in the class. We once made a paper airplane, <laughs> and um, like we had to like transcribe the whole conversation with well, that was going on, but during that we like made a paper airplane and had a competition on that. Um, it was to talk about like how conversation happens and how communication happens and how that's related to language. So I really love that class. I'm actually, I think my answer is kind of similar. I did a class, um, or I'm currently doing a class in the creative writing department called Teaching Imaginative Fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so Sounds what we do, amazing. it's super fun. What we do is we like spend the semester workshopping lesson plans around poetry, and then we spend two weeks doing a residency at the local middle school. So for two weeks, I went to the same seventh grade class every single day and taught them poetry. And the kids get to write their own poems, and then I like compile a book of their poetry, and they come to campus and perform at the Cat and the Cream, which is one of our campus spaces in December. Um, I'm gonna be so proud. I'm just like so excited. Um, and I like that class because it's very hands-on learning experience. So yeah. like I'm learning about the poems, but I'm also learning things from the students. I'm learning things from my professor, but also from the peers. Um, and I think that Oberlin does highlight this idea of peer-to-peer -peer learning as well as like just learning from your environment besides just your professors. So I've really loved that. And I also like I do want to highlight one course I took, which is not an academic course. I took IFS, which is like an intro to peer helping skills. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a class where you are taught counseling skills. You just like read a bunch of stuff about different lived experiences and identity based things. Um, and it just really, I don't know, it teaches you how to be a better human to your fellow humans. And I think that learning those life things alongside the academic things is super valuable and important. And that's been one of my favorite classes here too. Yeah, so you can see there's definitely lots of options and good <laughs> classes there at Oakley for us to take. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's again, the first year sermon I've taken and it has been so like true, the best class I've taken throughout the whole year I've been here. So um, the reason I like it is oh, both because, you know, the like the content we teach and also the style of teaching mm -hmm. because, you know, um, so it was a class done by a politics, again, politics professor. <laughs> I just love politics. Um, and it's on this book, you know, called That's Cut Up by Karl Marx. Apparently you can tell something about the politics department here. Um, and, you know, the, the content, you know, I never imagined that a class can be spent, you know, entire semester on a single book. And we pay we pay basically so like close attention on this book, and basically we can just like you know remember what line from which part of the book, and that's like so important because it's a very like influential and meaningful book for like everyone to read. Uh, and also the style of teaching, uh, because you know you have a classroom with fifteen students and a professor. Uh, everyone's the first year, you know, there's no peer pressure at all. And you sit around the table as a seminar style, and you just you know talk to each other, talk to the professor. Professor, you know, actually know everyone's name, you know, since like the day two, I think, uh, after everyone introduced themselves. And that's, you know, kind of like this combination of a good book and, you know, good yeah. style of teaching really makes a class exceptional for me. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's why I recommend everyone take first year seminars. Um, so, we got another question. So, what are your relationships like with faculties or with advisors? <laughs> well, I'll just, you know, talk more about that because I've been mentioning Paul Expressor all along. So, um, you know, I have, I know this Paul Expressor since my first semester of my first year, and he has been my advisor, you know, since that time. And we've been, you know, just basically the mandatory time you need, you need to see your advisor is when you start your restoration. And the professor has a code for you to do your own registration for the next semester. And that's like 
what if you are not, you know, that close to your advisor? That's like the only time you need to see them. That's like, you know, a good way, you know, of, you know I don't know if you don't really don't like advisor, but I don't think that's common here at all. Um, and, you know, but, you know, throughout the whole semester and uh, all the period, the, uh, that person being your advisor, um, you can always drop in their office hours or send them, you know, an email asking anything like you're interesting or, you know, both academics and, uh, like I said, you know, personal things, you know, that matters to you. And because they are advisors and they are, you know, really, really nice people and nice professors, they care about what you say, they care about your, your side of the story, and, you know, it's, it's a personal relationship. And I think that, that was, you know, makes the uh, opening very special for me. So, anyone want to share anything with faculties? I think in terms of advisors, um, okay. as a first year, you're assigned to a professor randomly. So it's not necessarily like in the department that you might major in. And so for me, like I got a history professor as my advisor, and then I declared my econ major. And so now I have an econ professor as my advisor, but I still go to my first advisor as well mm -hmm. to talk to her. So I think it's really nice to be able to establish relationships with different professors through yeah. advising um, and also through classes like the language pedagogy class I was talking about. I go to her office hours very often and she would like brainstorm with me about like teaching ideas and it's super nice to be able to do that. Yeah, I would super second the idea of like having advising relationships with people who aren't necessarily your assigned advisor yeah um i mean i have a great advisor but and i have throughout the years but what happened for me was like i had a i had a random advisor as a freshman and then when i declared my major was given someone new and then like every single year whoever i was with happened to retire <laughs> no. so i have like rotated for advisors every year so far and that's actually been okay because even if it wasn't like one steady relationship, I have lots of different faculty on campus that I trust and can go to. People are happy if you show up in their office hours, even if you've never taken a class with them and you just know you like are interested in what they teach, you can show up and just have a conversation. They're gonna be happy about that. Um, and like, I think my steadiest advisor has been someone who was never my official advisor, which was my first year seminar professor. Yeah. I just show up in his office all the time and I'm like, Kurt, help me, please. <laughs> and I think- Tell me what to do with yeah. my life. <laughs> and the thing is that like, the professors here often like allow you to see them on a human level. Um, yeah. You know, he like, like I mentioned earlier, he's had us to his house for brunch as a seminar. And like, that was very sweet. And I also, um, I don't know. I think like there's something so valuable to be said for that like human relationship, not just someone droning at you all the time. Yeah, I have. I really do have four professors on this campus who are like consistent advisors in my life. Only two of them are technically my actual advisors, um, but I go to all of them for just advice about life and advice about how things are going. So I really completely agree that if your if your assigned advisor can be one of your biggest supports, and both of my advisors really are. But then at the same time, you can have other people outside of those advisors advising you. Um, faculty are also just so supportive. I'm really interested in taking an international security class next semester and I never met the um, professor who teaches it, never heard of him. Like I didn't know who he was at all. I sent him an email and was like, I'm super interested um, in your class next semester and I'd like really love to talk about it more. And he was like, come to office hours. And so I'm going to his office hours, you know, having like never met him, not knowing much about about what he is interested in, what he teaches, um, but that's so normal. Literally one of my friends, her advisor, she loves so much, she was like, you have to meet her. And so I went to her office hours and I was like, my friend has told me so much about you and really wanted me to meet you. And she's become like a professor who I love spending time with. Um, and so it's just like stuff that is, um, can be really informal, but is also just like so human based mm -hmm. where it's like people getting to know other good people, which mm -hmm. I really love. And I feel that's also true for like any teachers who are teaching, who is teaching you right now, yeah. right? You can, because I think most of all professors care so much about their, like their, what they taught and also their students. So you can basically approach them after classes, just, you know, for quick chat or for even long conversations during the office hours. So, you know, those teachers are not scary. They are not, you know, there to get you, but, you know, they are people who care about you. So, yeah. Okay. So we have another question is, um, is double majoring common at Obling? Yes, yes, it is. 60% yes. of the student body double majors. 
is. Um, so more than half of us double major. So not only is it common, um, it is the most common, um, but you definitely don't have to double major. Um, if one major for you is plenty, one major for you is plenty. If you want to major in minor, you can do that. If you want to double major, if you want to double major in minor, if you want to double major, double minor. If you want a concentration, um, if you want a concentration, <laughs> if you want a triple yes. major, like you can do all yeah. of the things. Uh, but it's really accessible. I think lots of people really love to think about the intersectionality of many majors and where they meet in a lot of ways. Uh, and so people will double major because they'll look at two things and be like, I'm interested in both of these things, especially where they come together. Mm -hmm. How do I study that and bring the majors together? Mm -hmm. I wonder how many of us are double majors. You're a double major? Yeah, I'm a double major. One major, no minors, no concentration. But she's That's doing a lot of other things. But I'm well. doing other yeah. things. And I exactly. feel like I still get the exact same breadth of experience. Mm -hmm. oh, it just, absolutely. It yeah. just depends how you want to mix and match the classes mm -hmm. that you have. For sure. Right. But you know, given the percentage percentage here, you can tell like you, you know, can tell how many people yeah. <laughs> actually double major at Obley. And you know, I see lots of majors kind of like complement to each other, such as my major, politics and economics. You can actually, you know, I think it's a very good way of learning this about like anything going on in society. You don't, you, you maybe you like you become a little bit biased when you only take one major, you know, from a politics we have a, we have a point, but you actually start two majors that are related to each other. That's a good, uh, give you a very good combination to actually know, you know, talk about different things from different perspectives. And lots of people, you know, really enjoy that, including myself. I also think the reason there's a common double major in China is that people stumble into it. Right. They just find oh, classes yeah. they really like, they keep taking them, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're like, oh, I only need like yeah. two more things. My <laughs> politics <laughs> minor is <as> well. <laughs> my yeah. politics minor is accidental. I literally had a meeting with my advisor two days ago, <laughs> and he was looking out of my classes and was like, Kayla, you have a politics minor. And I was like, oh, cool, I'm gonna go declare it. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one bonus thing for everyone to know. Yeah. yeah. All right. So another question is Zachary asks, uh, what are the research opportunities like on and both, both on and off campus at Oberlin? Mm -hmm. Do any of us so, have research experience? So I think we can divide I've this up for I've science researched majors and social campus. science. Yes. Yeah. We can do this for science majors and social science. So, yeah. Go, go, go. Me? Oh, okay. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I've done research on campus. Um, I've done research in social sciences, but I can talk about it a little, I can talk a little bit about both. Um, so when it comes to research, we have a lot of different types of research opportunities. The research that I actually did was required within the course of a class. Um, for the politics major, um, you actually have to take a seminar class where you write a massive research paper. Um, and so I had to write a 30 page research paper. Um, and I'm not majoring in politics anymore, but had to write this paper um, and do the research presented through the course of a class syllabus. Um, so kind of in terms of thinking about this class syllabus, what we were studying, and then how my research could complement that. Um, in two of my classes this semester, I'm presenting a research proposal at the end of one of them and a term paper, which is basically a shorter research paper at the end of another. So you're gonna get a lot of opportunities to do research in and out of class in a lot of capacities when it comes to social sciences and when it comes to regular sciences um, and even humanities and art no matter what you're interested in we have those opportunities for you um, because Oberlin wants you to have the experience of being able to know how to research, how to go into the library and look for the resources that you need, how to really look at something in depth, how to create a research question, how to do all of those things. Um, my research proposal class is required for my major. And so thinking about all of that, you'll have that experience within classes. So that's a little bit of what like on campus research looks like within the scope of a class. But then we also have research fellows, research assistants, who are people who do on campus research. And I don't know if any of y'all have more of experience with that um, but that's still considered on campus stuff too yeah I was a research fellow but it was not in my major at all I was <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping like a Korean history professor um, to read Japanese sources interpret them and translate them that's so cool. yeah it was not in my major at all but it was still a good experience to like get my hands on some historical texts that I've never have read and I will never really read on my own yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, agree. I, there's definitely total, totally a lot of options there for social science. Um, you know, me, I, do, I did a small project for my uh, another politics professor 
on Chinese history and Chinese different political thoughts. And they just come randomly, you know, he's sending me an email asking you whether I want to do this. You know, no one actually, like, I never know there's something like that. I can do be a research assistant when in college professors, but you know, that email just basically made me a research assistant. So that shows how many opportunities we have, you know, for social science, but also for science on campus. I have a friend who is a biology major and I think she has been in a lab on campus since the second year um, of her college life. And at first, you know, we were able to talk about the things she did, she did in the lab because, you know, I, I'm like, I got well, biology classes in my high school. And I was able to understand what she did. But when she go, you know, she's the senior as me right now. And whenever she started talking about the lab she does right now, I like, I could never understand what she does. <laughs> but that shows like what level of engagement and involvement into the lab yeah. stuff. Because they are yeah. getting a lot more complicated and basically you're staying in lab for you know three years three yeah. years and doing a little bit more uh complicated stuff later on and just you know shows uh interactions between you know, yeah you know, if you yeah. want some facts and figures um <laughs> I think yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, about two-thirds of students on campus are involved in research at any given time over the past few years Oberlin professors have received more than 5.25 million dollars from the National Science Foundation to make this research happen. Um, and also, um, research assistance is like a paid position, which yeah. is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's across the disciplines, like we already mentioned. And then of course we have like opportunities like winter term, summer research. Mm -hmm. So you can do it off campus. Mm -hmm. You can find positions in labs that aren't here. Um, but if you do want to be in a lab here on campus, there are no grad students competing for those spots because right. we're all undergrads. So like Luke mentioned, you can get started really early and really see the whole project through, right. which means that more papers being published out of Oberlin by professors are co-authored by students that yeah. are solely authored by professors. Um, it's not because the professors are lazy, that's because the <laughs> students are like really getting involved. Yeah. Yeah. And that means that you can present at conferences and then when you graduate and you want to get a job, you want to go to grad school, you're like, look at this cool thing I did. <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah. people are excited to see it. It's yeah. literally as easy as sending an email to a professor who you know does research is something you're interested in, being like, do you need help with that research? And the professor being like, yeah, don't, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. Um, help me out and you have a research position. Yeah, or they send an email to you and you, you don't know how, but you just become one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, and that's also true for zero science is you, you know, professors write papers in different articles and yeah. you become kind of a co-author or you know, research assistant kind of, you know, credit to in the, you know, their actual articles. So that's a, I love your cool things. So, okay. Now, another Ooh. question. So please explain the opening honor code. Just to clarify what a pal is. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I work as a pal here at Oberlin and that stands for Spirit. Too. Yeah. Woo, we're all pals. Okay. We are all pals. Yeah, I, were, pals. I was former pal. Oh, you were exactly. pals. I remember you got yeah. training. <laughs> So a pal is like a peer advising leader. You are assigned to the cohort of 15 freshmen. That's usually like in conjunction with their first year seminar. Yep. And then you work with them throughout the first semester and also during orientation and just like introduce them to Oberlin life, help them figure out the honor code for one thing. And yep. then things like winter term registration, course registration. Um, but yeah, we do a whole session dedicated to honor code. So we have learned a lot about it. We've read mm -hmm. that sucker so many times. <laughs> True. Um, so Oberlin's honor code is really just something that exists to keep us accountable, but also to build a community where you can explore intellectually with complete freedom and know that like you're going to get credit for your work and you're going to give your friends credit for their work. You're really being treated as like an adult in your field. <laughs> um, so basically what that means is that like you are agreeing to sign the honor code at the end of most of your um, assignments. Just like say that you've adhered to it and to adhere to the honor code, you can't cheat, plagiarize, um, fabricate. fabricate. So basically all the things that you shouldn't be doing anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and part of this means that you have to hold each other accountable. So it is part of the honor code that like, if you know someone is breaking it, you are like asked to report them. Yeah. And if you don't report them, like that is then a violation in itself because we're yeah. all, working to uphold this community together so that we get the credit that is due for the work we're doing. Um, what I will say, what's the coolest thing is it really is you being treated as an academic adult because not only are we adhering to the honor code, but then the faculty that we work with adhere to the honor code. So like in ways of like, you 
when you give the faculty a really good idea on the book that they're reading, they're gonna acknowledge you in the book. Um, and like really, really cool stuff like that. So when you read a faculty's paper, and you use that in your research you get to like acknowledge your own professor like mm -hmm. just like really cool things to be holding us accountable and making sure that we are like academic yeah. adults exactly yeah. and i think all of that makes a possibility that you know professors are required to leave the room while we have exams midterms and finals and that's i don't know about your high school experience <laughs> but that makes my exam you know experience way better yeah. because i got anxiety all the time when people working around you yeah. And this, you know, all the honor code makes, you know, basically you're on your own, but you know, you can focus on your own exams and you don't care about what other people are saying and you don't need to care about what people are doing. And, you know, there's no one disrupting you. And, you know, basically the concept of, you know, you are on yourself as an adult is really, you know, really helping me doing good on my exams. So I really like that. The honor code exists like to give us that level of trust, right? Your professor yeah. Yeah. trusts that you're gonna do what you're supposed to be doing. They leave the room during the exam or they can give you a take home exam because they know that you're gonna adhere to these rules. Yeah. And it allows for a lot more flexibility. Like if you need an extension, if you need it to be take home for whatever accommodation, they're more willing to do that because we have this honor code in place. Yeah. Okay, so next question. So Tracy asked, what are some great places to study at Albany and in the town in general? Ooh, study spots. <laughs> Does anyone have some favorites? Um, I mean, I like to study in the library. I just like classic library. I also tend to go to like the upper floors where it's a little quieter because I get distracted very easily. <laughs> so I have like, there's these really cool like I don't know, it's like a collection of cushiony chairs all pushed together. Oh, yeah. And I like to kind of flop in the cushions <laughs> and do my work quietly. Um, or I like to work outside while it's nice. Like, I'll find a bench. We have these, like, swinging, swing benches under some of the trees. Mm -hmm. And I really like to study, like, in the benches and kind of be yeah, outside. It's really cute. Yeah. Exactly. So if you ever visit Oberlin, you got to check out the second floor or third floor one. <laughs> the second floor got all those uh, small like chairs and yeah. things together, and they have all own chairs. Yeah. That's a good place you can you can just be yourself and you know it's nobody serve you and face uh, one single direction, but everyone's you know the chairs from you, room chairs. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I love you know the third floor of Mad as well because it's a quiet place and you know you can do your own thing while being a public space, and that makes me focus. So yeah, what about you guys? Um, I also like the study spaces in the dorms. Mm -hmm. So I live in Asia House and we have a library on the second floor. So it's oh, really it's nice that I don't mm -hmm. even have to leave my dorm when it's cold outside. I can be in my dorm, but still it's a library. It's like a nice study space in there. Um, and also, um, there's like a, there's like a, can they hear us? No. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> room in one of the happened. classroom oh. buildings. And they have like a nice space where um, you can study, but also they have like three D printer and also like a big screen where you can like play different DVDs and stuff. Yeah, yeah. My favorite place to study is Slow Train. I know I've already mentioned it, but it's our coffee shop downtown. Um, I just love going there and sitting and doing work and drinking hot chocolate and and hanging out. Um, I need a little bit of like background noise for me to be able to focus. Uh, so I think Slow Train is great. And the Language Building Peters is also a great place by the fireplace. Uh, just to double check, I don't know if there's a way for the audience to indicate, but something happened here. Can you guys hear us? Can, can they like tell us? Okay. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> well, keep, keep facial expressions now. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. The um, light changed, and we were like, wait a second. Yes. This made some weird noises. <laughs> okay. So next one is Allison ask. I struggle with organizations. What type of uh, what type do academic sports does Oberlin offer? Awesome. That's okay. a great question. So academic sports. So we have like a lot of, we have um, like a student life office that runs LEAD courses. Mm -hmm. um, LEAD stands for learning enhancement and academic across disciplines, learning enhancement across disciplines. <laughs> Got it. That's hard. Yeah. And so these courses are specifically designed for like helping you learn learning skills and academic skills so one of them is like the pal course where you're just learning about overland life you're getting help setting things up organizing your class schedule organizing what your winter term will look like but they also do just have like more um 
specific courses around different skills and organization is definitely included if not in a particular course then like you can go into that office and talk to someone there they have like little groups that meet and talk about different study skills organization skills that work and you can kind of workshop with people there peers as well as faculty um do you guys know of any other good resources i think the center for student success they were talking mm -hmm. about they also yeah. host like um um workshops so, like one-on-talks -on -talks and things like that mm -hmm. i went to their like how to not procrastinate for example. <laughs> <laughs> and the people were like probably the people who come will not really procrastinate as much as the people who don't come to the workshops yeah. but still like they hold workshops and you can also make a one-on-one -on -one appointment with the people in the office right and also i don't i think this is still happening is lots of different classes especially uh science classes have their own individual uh, tutors and uh, class mm -hmm. assistants yeah. those are the people who grading your papers and homeworks and also who available to give kind of like a whole class uh, tutorials on you know different subjects that people are actually struggle with and also they are available for individual uh, tutoring for you know if you ask them you know via email or something after classes um, I did I used to be a tutor for econ class and you know we organize uh, study sessions before midterms and finals to, for the whole class to just give them kind of like a review and Q&A sessions to make, you know, and also speaking from our own experience of taking the class before and giving kind of like a prep for, you know, what's coming up. And that's also, you know, very meaningful because we are actually the people who are grading different people's homeworks and we know what are the most common errors mm -hmm. being different, you know, part of the classes. So we can be, you know, very focused on, you know, on helping students like you know, yeah. basically customize our teaching. Yeah. For and students. all the tutoring resources like writing associates, um, speaking right. center, things like that, these are all totally free. Yeah. Um, so if you want to take advantage of that, it is always available to you. I think all the things we mentioned are free. Right? Yeah. Yes, so, so, all yeah. things you can you just need to ask or just yeah. go to a session. <laughs> yes. Okay. So next question is where is your favorite place to eat in Obel? Stevie. <laughs> yeah, <I'm pretty. laughs> no, that's the main dining hall on campus. Yes. Um, I, I do actually, I like spending time in Stevie because my friends and I will just like have big long meals there and you can, once you swipe in, you can just like take mm. as many entrees and snacks as you want and just keep eating and eating. I'm always hungry. <laughs> so that works really well for me. But I think like my favorite place actually out in the town of Oberlin, I really like to go to the Mandarin. Um, mm -hmm. It's like just, I don't know, it's delicious. Their portions are huge. It's very like homey. There's a cute little fish tank in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right. And it's very affordable. So that's my favorite place to go out and eat. Mm -hmm. I love Katrina's. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. It's like oh, a taco okay. place. And they have rice bowls that will save their life. <laughs> I feel like I actually like cook more now, so I never yeah. go anywhere to eat, but it's nice to get together with friends and cook because every mm -hmm. dorm here at Oberlin has a kitchen in there, which is, I think is really nice. Um, if I would choose from the town, I would choose Kim's. It's like a small um, Asian grocery store and like an eatery, and they have pretty good like Korean food. Yeah, I mean, for me on campus, I like Dick Huff because sometimes you just need to rush things, you know, especially. I got a class at 30, I got up at night. <laughs> so, you know, you want to just grab something and go, you know, and uh, Dick Hops is the place that, you know, have lots of, you know, ready to go, uh, you know, bagels and, you know, breakfast sandwiches in the morning and also some lots of, you know, like salads, entrees and burgers, like for lunch and dinners that you can just grab and then and pay in the front and just go somewhere else you want to be to eat, you know, on your own or with friends. You know, they have a small place near the cup for you to eat with friends as well. But you know, this is a good place, a good place, you know, for you just go and get something quick and yeah. you know, do your own thing after that. Yeah. Okay, so next question is what's the orientation like at Oblin and how does Oblin help students feel at home? What about for international students? So there are lots of questions. We can, like, yeah. 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 we can ask, I mean, we can answer each. Yeah. yeah, we can kind of build it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah, so one cool thing about orientation is that that is when you start meeting with your peer advising leader. So you will have a meeting with your pal and then your cohort of other first years every single day of orientation. So that is mm -hmm. like built in, safe place to land, familiar faces from day one. Yeah. Um, and that does help structure your time a little bit so you're not just like wandering around, classes <laughs> haven't started yet. There are things that are being offered for you to do. Um, my favorite part of orientation is for the Connect Cleveland Day. So this is one way I think that we help students feel at home like in Ohio and like 
with the city nearby. Um, what, what happens on that day is that you go with your pal group and then you have a morning activity that's kind of structured in Cleveland. So like this year, my group went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame so much fun and last year we did the art museum so there's lots of different options but then you all have lunch with all the other first years you get a chance to talk to people from different groups and then in the afternoon you can go kind of wherever you want the museums are free and open to Oberlin students there are food trucks there's like games out on the lawn so that day is really an opportunity to like you come to campus you've settled in for a few days then you get to go to Cleveland for the day and meet new people who you haven't maybe had in your group or in your hall so far it's kind of like a mix and match experience um and i think that's one of my favorite orientation bits yeah i'm trying to think pal is obviously a really big part of orientation but i think one of the coolest things about orientation is it's just super scheduled um mm -hmm. but it's up to you to go to what you want to yeah. go to mm -hmm. so there's always things going on meaning like there's talks there's panels meeting professors um concerts. concerts um fairs for uh like you know a million things classes excos all that good stuff uh, and you get to decide what you want to do and what you want to go to so if you're like you know i really want to talk to this professor who's going to be on this panel i'm going to go to this panel you know but i have a good idea of the classes i want to register for so i'm maybe not going to go to the registration one but then later there's an ice cream social um for international students so i'm going to go to that um so it really gives you a lot of flexibility to design orientation how you want it to look but to make sure that you have a lot of structure throughout the course of the um few days so that you're not walking around aimlessly like i don't know what to do or spending too much time in your room if that's not what you and for international students, you um, arrive three days before all the students arrive on campus. And we have people called international peer mentors. Basically, we're also in like a group just like the PAL program, where it's like about 10 international students first years and then one international peer mentor. And then we give a campus tour because a lot of international students don't get to visit campus. It was super fun. We had like a three hour tour and I got to go around all downtown and also campus. Um, yeah, it's a really long tour. <laughs> exactly. Um, and there's also several sessions about like the visa process, insurance, and financial aid, but also like how to adapt to the US. What is US culture like? This year we talked about greeting and like how do you respond when someone says, what's up? <laughs> I don't even know. I think this is so weird. Yeah. The so, sky. <laughs> It's a nice opportunity to connect with like about a hundred international students. It's like a nice community you have before all the students arrive and you know yourself around. Mm -hmm. And that time, like the campus just feel dominated by two central students. Yeah, whenever you see a face, you know they're coming from like sex and you know similar backgrounds for like you, and you just start a conversation. And that's mm -hmm. a, like a really good period. Yeah. Um, and also, I like the phrase that you know we want to make. Of the Cleveland area and opening in general, like home away from home. Mm -hmm. And you know, by doing that, you know, we, we basically place every first year and transfer student into kind of like both group settings and also within personal relationship with you know with different upper class people and also the professors, faculties. And that's where you know you introduce you to you know both your peers and also people who know a little bit more to help you go through all the things. So I think that's you know my orientation. I think right now the orientation is definitely much more better than the orientation before in my year because we now have actually the yeah. pop groups and you know all those things are actually more structured and I think that's a big improvement. Yeah, it's grown a lot. Yes. Okay. So the next question is from Emily from uh, Pittsburgh. Okay. Yes! Shout out to Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, the question is, can you talk about Xcodes? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love Xcodes. It's going to take it away. Okay. So Xcode is short for Experimental College. This is a really cool system in which students, but sometimes also faculty and townsfolk, can apply to teach a course that is not already offered through Oberlin's curriculum. So you have to build a whole syllabus, you have to have references, an interview with the expert community, and actually prove that you can teach the course that you say you can teach. Um, and then after that point, once you're given your class, what happens is you can have students sign up to take your course for co-curricular credits, which are kind of like elective credit. So um, it's really interesting because Xcos fill a whole lot of different 
needs on campus. There are some language expos for languages that we don't have departments for. So like ASL and Korean, Wolof, those are offered. Um, there are very serious expos, more thought-based. Like this year, someone is teaching the aesthetics of late capitalism, which is cool. so intense, um, but very cool also. Yeah. Then there's like movement-based expos. So there's dance, there's Aikido, there's fencing, things like that. But then of course, there's also just random fun things that people felt like teaching. Can, I'm yeah. gonna talk a little bit about Match Co because it, I feel like it. it's really important. Um, <laughs> this semester we have an expo that it's actually taught by two of my good friends on The Bachelor. Uh, but the really cool opportunity was The Bachelor was actually filming in oh, yeah. Cleveland. <laughs> and so we got invited to go to the filming and the pre-rose ceremony, uh, which was pretty unbelievable. And then the executive producer of The Bachelor sat in on the batch cloak, batch cloak class. <laughs> um, so my friend actually got to take a picture with Peter. Peter didn't know he was in the picture, he was doing something mm -hmm. else, but both of their faces are in the picture at the same time because Peter was in downtown Cleveland at the same time. That's that my so we also get some really cool opportunities with different expos that yeah. are presented to us. And yeah. it's also just like fun teaching experience. Yeah. Oh yeah, you get, and you get credit. Mm -hmm. I don't I yeah, think you get credit to teach way. or to take. And like I've been teaching cryptozoology so it's like the study of bigfoot and the loch ness monster and stuff for like three years now and again like weird things pop up like i found out there's an oberlin grad who made a whole movie about bigfoot and he like reached out to me and wanted to send me a copy of this film that's amazing. like okay <laughs> Well, like, from, yeah, from the perspective of a student, Mai is like much less cooler than the bachelor. <laughs> but um, you know, Mai is like uh, debating and public speaking. Yeah. And I couldn't imagine me doing this panel like today if I couldn't, if I didn't take that yeah. class. So yeah. that was you know, a big help for me, you know, coming from a you know, very kind of shy background of a high school and then yeah. you know, just doing this right now. So that's, yeah. 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 And some Mexicos are gateway into clubs as well. Right. So we have like the Taiko drumming Mexico and you can join the Taiko um, group as well later on, or like the fencing expo can lead to the fencing club too. Yeah. I think it's nice and too. public speaking and debating leads to debate club and also more you and club. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, next question is from uh, Rina. Uh, so Rina wants to know in what ways do you think Oblin is different from all other small liberal colleges? That's a really good mm. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when I talk about Oberlin, I can say with firm knowledge that there's no other place in the world that is like Oberlin. Uh, no other place in the world, so no other small liberal arts college, no other location in the world. Oberlin is like Narnia. You drive, <laughs> <laughs> let me explain. You are driving through like, you know, rural Ohio, you're not sure what to expect, and then you stumble on this oasis of a little town um, that just has the coolest, most eclectic, unique folks that you will ever meet in your entire life. And I firmly believe the world should look a little more like Oberlin um, in a lot of ways. So I say that to say that in a lot of ways, Oberlin is extremely unique. I think when it comes to like the way our classes are structured or like, you know, the professors that we have and all of those things, those maybe aren't as individualized and look a lot like other small liberal arts schools. But then the student body that we have, the club opportunities that we have, the interpersonal connections that we make, the way that we communicate with our professors and the intensity that we have for our love for learning, that's unique to Oberlin and the student body that's here. Yeah. I think, well, for international students, opening, especially I think for people coming from, you know, a background, you know, from like East Asian countries, opening is very unique because opening has a century long connection with East Asia and Asia in large general like areas. You know, we have, you know, Japanese and Chinese programs in East Asian study environment are very strong and politics department has also, you know, very different professors focus on different areas and those professors are very, you know, kind of like very big stars in their field and they know what's actually going on when, you know, in your you know, hometown or, you know, where the place you come from. So those are kind of like part of, you know, like I just said, is, you know, part of, you know, what your academic interests could, you know, be aligned to, but also your personal interests, your personal stories that are actually being listened and taken seriously at Open because all those connections with, you know, different places around the world. I think, okay, now we're going to our final questions. Final so, questions. final questions is, what do you love most about Oberlin? 
Oh. It's like a circle to our why opening questions yeah. in the introduction. It's yeah. hard as a senior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna say the people, and I know that's like so cliche, and everyone's like, "Okay, look, come on," but <laughs> it really is. I'm like, you know, every time I leave here and then come back and I interact with and I meet new people, I'm just wowed by their vast interests and their experiences that they've had and what they want to do with their lives and what makes them unique and why they're here and what their story is and it's just like so incredibly unbelievable people here are so friendly like you know i am a smiley person so i'll be like walking down the street smiling at people and most of the time people smile back it's like a wild concept um and i just love getting to know individuals on campus and i think here like make Oberlin like Narnia and the fact that it's beautiful when it snows and we have pretty cool lights everywhere but um I I just the people are incredible yeah I would like to emphasize on that I think like the diversity in terms of like passion and interest on campus is really amazing like I'm always amazed like you know I had a friend in my econ class we were like just doing econ together and then I go to a dance showcase and she's dancing on yeah. stage like center stage and I'm like whoa you do that too <laughs> So I think everyone's doing so many things and it's so cool to see all these people getting involved in different activities and different majors and it's really nice to like, you know, do, being able to like STEM and then also music and education and all yeah. at the same time. Yeah. yeah, I think along those lines, people really show up for each other here. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, I don't know, like if you have something you're interested in, you want to share it, people are going to be excited and want to come see what you've worked on. Yeah. Um, and like, that I noticed even just as a prospective student when I visited people like were so excited about what each other were doing, what I was interested in doing. Um, and that's an amazing, amazing feeling. And along with that, I think that like the way that Obi's talk to each other is just so deep. Like I could meet <laughs> someone for the first time and have a very deep oh, conversation, yeah. really get to know them. People aren't afraid to like share themselves, share their emotions and like, you know, maybe Sometimes when you first come to college, it's a rough landing because you're in a whole new place and you're going through a lot of different changes. Um, and I think that one thing that was really special to me is that here you don't have to hide that feeling. People are willing to meet you where you are, give you the help you need, and just talk to you on a really human level rather than just a surface level. And um, I don't know, you know that people are going to show up for you in a bunch of different ways. I, could, I couldn't agree with that more. You know, just like I said, people you know, couldn't care more about your personal perspectives and stories. You know, the concept of, you know, you need to pay attention to different opinions from different people. I don't think it ex ex exists everywhere around yeah. the world. And Oblin is this unique place that gives everyone, like, the right to tell their stories and people actually genuinely listen to you. And that makes you feel, you know, you actually exist and feel like you're someone yeah. connected to other people yeah. at this small town. So, yeah, that's very, can get a very personal and, you know, can also get, you know, very warm in a sense. Yeah. And the, la oh, and the last thing I'm going to say is just that, like, I'm a really weird person. I don't, I like, I don't know if other people can relate Everybody to that, <laughs> but like, I'm like super weird. And I had like a lot of insecurities coming into college being like, I am so weird. Um, and I have really strange interests and I'm really unique. And like, you know, I have a lot of things that I offer, but a lot of things that I don't too. And I feel like out of place at Oberlin, not out of place like Oberlin, at Oberlin, everyone here is weird in like, <laughs> yeah. in like the, yeah, the best, yes. the best way. <laughs> and we're all in, like, we all love that. Yeah, <laughs> we all love it. And, and we're, all of it. And we're yeah. in it together. And, you know, we're going to be the weird people who go out into the, who go out into the world, but who change the world. And like, I fully believe that Oberlin says it in their mantra, but we are going to be those weird people who people, other people look at and are like, what are you doing here? And we're going to be like, just watch, like, check out our knowledge, check out our experience, check out our passions. Like, we're going to be it's like the best line to end this video. <laughs> so thank you for watching and ask such great questions. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.